Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the American Enterprise Institute. I'm pleased to welcome you to today's event, Climate, Energy, Crisis and Transition, a conversation with Steve Koonin. Uh, my name is Ryan Streeter. I'm the Director of Domestic Policy Studies here at the American Enterprise Institute, and I'm really pleased that you can join us today. One of the things that we um, really prioritize here at AEI and that we're proud of is having um, really good conversations and debates uh, kind of in the spirit of the competition of ideas and in a politicized environment and particularly politicized uh, topics like today's topic, we like to be able to sit down and have a conversation about what we know from the research, what we don't know and where we should go. And that's what today's conversation is going to be about. Today's discussion is, is centered on topics in Steve Koonin's uh, best-selling book, Unsettled, What Climate Science Tells Us, What It Doesn't, and Why It Matters. And um, I will introduce um, Steve and, and Bob McNally, who will be interviewing him here in just a second. But before I do that, I do want to make sure that you are clear on how to submit questions, uh, which will be taken up uh, towards the end of their discussion. You can send them um, in one of two ways. One is by email to ian.banks at aei.org. That's ian.banks at aei.org. Um, or you can send them through on Twitter to hashtag Kunin Climate. And you should see that on your screen. Um, so I'm really pleased to be joined today by Steve Kunin, who is a colleague here at AEI. He's a non-resident senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, where he focuses on climate science and energy policies. He's also a university professor at the New York at New York University (NYU), uh, where he is a professor of information operations and management sciences at the Stern School. Um, a professor of civil engineering at the Tandon School of Engineering, and also a professor of physics at the College of Arts and Sciences. And if you've read his book, you know um, that he spent some time as the Undersecretary of Energy in the Obama administration at the Department of Energy, uh, where he was the chief scientific officer and has also been the chief scientific officer at BP. Um, but prior to all of that, he spent um, three decades as a theoretical physicist at Caltech, where he also served for over a decade as, as its provost. And so we're really pleased to be able to welcome Steve um, back to AEI to have this conversation today about his book and the related issues. And joining him and, and conducting the conversation will be Bob McNally, who's the founder uh, and president of the Rapidan Energy Group, which is an independent uh, consulting energy consulting and market advisory firm based here in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, Bob has over 30 years of government and market experience as an energy consultant, a senior White House official, and a hedge fund strategist. He's a regular commentator in the media, uh, has testified before Congress on topics such as energy markets and national security, and he will be leading our discussion today with Steve. So once again, if you do have questions, you don't have to wait until the end to submit them. We can queue them up, queue them up as you have them. Uh, send them through to ian.banks at aei.org or on Twitter at hashtag uh, Kunin Climate. And so without any <clears throat> further words from me, I'm going to turn this over to Bob so he can start the discussion with Steve. Uh, gentlemen, welcome and uh, take it away. Ryan, thank you so much, and thank you to AEI for sponsoring this discussion. I'm delighted to be here. And Steve, what an honor it is for me to spend an hour with you uh, and 120 or so of our of our friends who are, are participating. I uh, can't think of a better time, a more important subject, and a better person to be talking with. I just want to put in the obligatory plug for your outstanding book. Uh, I read it back to back. It's full of notes and questions and underlines. Um, you deciphered uh, climate science for non-experts like myself in a, a astute and concise way. But what really jumps out uh, and impressed me was the courage uh, that you exhibit in uh, talking about uh, you know what is settled and what is unsettled and how that line may differ from the conversation we're seeing often in this hyper-politicized debate that uh, Ryan just mentioned. So. Uh, really enjoyed the book. Could not recommend it more strongly to everyone, uh, including those listening to us. So uh, what we're going to do today is have a conversation. I'm delighted to interview you. We're going to throw some questions, some some uh, some uh, various questions, some hardballs, not, not too many softballs, and uh, and then we're going to get to Q and A. Uh, and so we're looking forward to seeing those questions come in, and we'll pose those over the next hour. So why don't we just start uh, with the title of your book? Um, we hear over and over again, the science is settled on climate change. Yet your book suggests there is science and climate change that is unsettled. I would like to ask you just at the, the high level, 
you know, where is the line between the body of science that you think is pretty much settled and then where it isn't settled? And then if you could then sort of compare where that line is and how it lines up with the public discussion that we see uh, often on climate change and climate policy. So, you know, where's the line between settled and yeah. unsettled in uh, your view? Uh, yeah, yeah, so just uh, before I begin to answer, Bob, thanks for uh, being willing to uh, engage with me today. And Ryan, thank you for bringing me uh, into the AEI community. I'm, I'm looking forward very much to interactions beyond this inaugural event. I, I think there are some things that most scientists would say are settled about the climate situation. The globe has been warming, um, and it's warmed about 1.1 1, 1. 1 degrees since 1900 uh, centigrade. Um, carbon dioxide is going up in the atmosphere, and that's almost all due to human influences. Uh, that carbon dioxide exerts a warming influence on the globe, and so there's good reason to expect that there's a correlation between the warming and the carbon dioxide. But exactly how the globe, the weather, and the climate will respond to growing human influences is really quite unsettled. Uh, and of course, what we're going to do about all of this is equally unsettled. And so that's where I think the line is, yeah, human influences are going up, temperatures going up, uh, but we're really not sure what this is going to mean for the changing climate. And how it's going to affect societies and what we should do about it. Okay. Your book um, talks about a, a long game of telephone uh, between the climate science and the scientific reports and the IPCC reports and the media and the political and public discussion that we have and suggests there's misrepresentations, something actually a lot gets lost in between. Could you elaborate on that? Why, why do we have this long game of telephone on such an important topic. Yeah. Well, one of my goals in writing the book, perhaps the primary goal, was to inform people rather than to persuade them. And I thought that it was important to inform people because of the growing disconnect that we're seeing between what the politicians and many people in business are saying, climate crisis, climate emergency, climate disaster. Whereas when you read the research literature or the official reports from the UN or the US government, it doesn't say anything of the sort. And as the information goes from those primary sources out to the media and then to the public, there are ample opportunities and incentives to distort. If you're a politician, you like to motivate people, and so you might spin the story one way or the other, Certainly, if you're in the media, dramatic stories sell the news that there isn't much happening with the climate, and that's true in many aspects, as I hope we'll discuss. That doesn't get your clicks and eyeballs. And so the non-experts are, I believe, not getting an accurate picture of what the science really says. Right. You, uh, I think you say often, and it certainly leaps from the book, Sci uh, climate is not weather. Climate is not weather. And uh, yet, I mean, one just needs to Google extreme weather and climate, and just everywhere you see uh, it just asserted that sort of human activities are causing climate change, and climate change is causing the unusual uh, number of uh, extreme weather events, billion dollar weather events, and so forth. Can you uh, explain and elaborate a little bit just where the line is between climate and weather and does one cause the other? And can we infer from uh, some of these dramatic weather events we're seeing that uh, this is caused by human, uh, human emissions? So weather happens every day. It changes. Sometimes even within a day, it changes. Climate is the long-term statistics of weather, averages, variances, and so on. And that long term is officially defined by the World Meteorological Organization as 30 years. And so you need to look at a period of 30 years to decide what the climate is and perhaps whether it's changing. So if an extreme event happens in one year, or even if it happens in two or three years, unless there is a trend over several decades, 
it's not a shift in climate. Let me give you an example. We saw extreme rainfall at the beginning of September here in the New York area. And we did indeed set a one day, I'm oh, sorry, a one hour record for the amount of rain in Central Park. It was three inches or something like that. Uh, and that record goes back to 1960. We don't have good data before that. On the other hand, if you look at the one day records, that day was only the fifth rainiest day in New York City history. And the rainiest day was in 1879. And so there were these long-term trends in the climate and the weather that you can get fooled by if uh, you're not paying attention to a long enough period. You can say, aha, it's human influence. But if it happened before, when human influences were much smaller, you've got some extra explaining to do. Yeah. Why don't we see more scientists doing what you're doing and pointing out uh, the nuances and the misrepresentations that are going on and the incorrect links? I'm just, I'm, you're, you know, I said earlier, you're quite courageous to do what you've done. I'm wondering, why aren't there more uh, doing that? There's thousands of climate scientists. And as you said, there's not just climate science. There's various aspects of climate science and so forth. Why don't we see more folks st uh, speaking out? You know, as I talk to, and I have, of course, over the years, talked to many climate scientists, you get a very different view from them in a private discussion than you do in the public presentation. Climate scientists do not have an incentive to speak out against the politicians or to the institutional statements. There's nothing but bad that can happen, particularly if you're early on in your career where you, you need to be promoted or you need to continue to get grants. Um, some climate scientists genuinely believe the planet is in peril and their mission is to save it. But most, in fact, as I said, give you a much more moderate view in private than they do in public. Right. And, and there are many climate scientists who have written me and said, you know, you got it about right, Steve. Uh, yeah. But, you know, the bottom line of my take on what to do is different than yours. And that's fine. That's a values discussion, not a science right. discussion. Right. So I'd like to start to link the discussion we're having about the science to policy. And uh, again, you served under President Obama and the Department of Energy is under Secretary for Science. And uh, so you've been around the block and um, you have a lot of stuff to say about, uh, a lot of good things to say about policy in your book. But let me, I'd like to actually quote uh, Senator Markey from just a few days ago uh, to again get you get your reaction because I think it brings together this sense of uh, uh, imminent apocalypse and emergency that's being portrayed through the long game of telephone that you describe and then policies currently under debate and reconciliation bill and so forth. Uh, so let me just ask you to respond to this. Senator Markey said um, there's a lot of talk recently about what progressive lawmakers need to be willing to cut. What will we be willing to negotiate on? Well, we can't negotiate with deadly wildfires. They don't negotiate. We cannot negotiate with massive hurricanes. They don't negotiate. We can't negotiate with flood water, sea level rise, and drought and temperature rise. We can't negotiate with how much these climate fuel disasters are costing us, tens of billions of dollars so far this year. It's time for us to stop talking about, about what is politically feasible and start talking about what is scientifically necessary. We cannot compromise on the science. What are your thoughts about Washington's climate debate currently? Yeah, well, uh, you know, I doubt that Senator Markey has really read uh, the scientific reports. Uh, perhaps he's read the summaries for policymakers, which give a rather pale reflection of what the actual science says. Um, you know, the alarmism uh, is just not justified by the scientific reports. Secretary Gutierrez, Secretary General of the UN, when the most recent UN report was released in August 9th, he said, code red for humanity. Billions of people will be in immediate peril unless we cut emissions and, and so on. And in fact, if you look for the phrase climate crisis, climate emergency, climate disaster, climate catastrophe, in the 4,000 pages of the UN report, you don't find any of those, except you do find the phrase climate crisis once in the report, and that's not used in a scientific context, but is used in the way that the 
American media describe the problem rather imperfectly. To take the specific things that Senator Markey mentions, we see no long-term trends in hurricanes. Sea level is rising more rapidly now than it was 40 years ago, but it was also rising as rapidly in the 1930s when human influences were much smaller. So there's a lot of natural variability. And even the current rate of rise is a foot a century. And now I'm sure that Mr. Markey would agree that Boston can certainly tolerate a foot a century. Um, I, I've forgotten the other ones that he mentioned. Yeah. Fires, okay? Yeah. We, you know, we actually can stop fires. Fires in the U.S. were five times larger in 1926 than they are now. They went down from 1926 to 1970, even as the globe warmed and the country warmed, because the U.S. Forest Service had a deliberate policy of fire suppression, Smokey the Bear and all of that. And yes, we've seen some uptick since 1970, but there's an awful lot of fuel in those fires that's waiting to be burned. And also we're building towns like Paradise in the middle of forests where they're very vulnerable. So at least on the fire front, um, a lot of human actions can in fact significantly reduce the problem. Right. Yeah, Steve, it's, it's hard to overstate the role of climate models uh, in, the, in, the, in the underlying Paris Agreement and connecting that to what governments are doing uh, and are trying to do uh, to abate emissions. Uh, President Biden wants to remove the 60% of power that comes from uh, carbon energy and electricity by 2035, 40% uh, gas, 20% coal. Europe is talking about banning cars uh, in uh, by 2035. Uh, and the IEA is saying we need to stop all new oil and gas investment if we want to meet net zero targets. And all of this reflects um, uh, an underlying uh, intention by, by the prevailing governments to get us to net zero by 2050 under the Paris Agreement, uh, which is driven by climate model uh, view, uh, projections of what human emissions will cause in terms of a temperature rise. Can you go right at that and just tell us, you know, sh should we be betting our farms and our societies and imposing these large costly policies on the basis of climate models that are informing the Paris Agreement and so forth? So climate modeling is one of the greatest computational challenges we face. The system is chaotic. We have poor historical data. There's a lot that happens on small scales, much smaller than the computer can describe. Uh, and so there's a lot of art and imprecision and uncertainty in the climate models. They do, of course, say that as CO2 goes up, the temperature will rise. But exactly how much? How much aerosols, which are a cooling influence, play a role and natural variability? These are all missing from the models, or at least are really uncertain in the models. Two world-class climate experts, Tim Palmer and Graham Stevens, writing in a prestigious journal in 2018, said the models give us a hazy picture of what might be happening on a global level, but are really, the Brits are not fit for purpose, uh, they say, at uh, regional prediction. And then Helen Nissan, uh, climate scientist at Columbia University, and colleagues wrote in 2019 that people place much too much confidence in the climate models, regional predictions, and we, the scientific community, should be disabusing them of the notion that we've got any degree of precision in what's going to happen. So it is a problem of making policy under deep uncertainty. And the people who favor prompt action will say, uncertainty is no excuse to act. And in fact, if it's uncertain, we should be acting more. On the other hand, we have to be very careful that what actions we take do not make the overall human or national situation worse than any effect from a change in climate. Right. You know, what I uh, also appreciated about your book is that you propose solutions or fixes or improvements uh, in both policy and then how we can maybe uh, uh, break this game of telephone that is getting us to a distorted event. 
debate. Could you describe a little bit about just how, through the assessment reports and so forth and reviews and how they're conducted, how we get from climate science to this distorted view of it and what you would suggest are fixes so that we'd have a more informed, a better informed uh, public discussion? The assessment reports uh, are drafted by uh, teams of scientists uh, who are handpicked by the governments or by the administration, if it's a U.S. report. Um, and so right away, you can sort of get the answer you want by picking the people you want. Uh, then they are reviewed uh, either by a community review, they send it out to many people to review, uh, or they give it to the national academies here in the U.S. Again, uh, a select group of people. Uh, and then the authors of the report in the end have final say as to what they want. And when you read these reports, you can see in many cases their goal has been to persuade rather than inform. And of course, I've talked to people who've been on the inside and helped write these reports, and they would confirm that view. I think what one needs as these reports get written is a red team review, which is what we use when we want high confidence or higher confidence in making critical decisions in engineering, for example, or in military matters. And there what you do is you charter a team of experts with the task of answering the question, what's wrong with this report? Where has it not presented things correctly, fairly? Where has it omitted uh, important facts and so on? Because you can find many things in the existing reports where a red team would have said, hey, that's not correct. You had better fix that. And uh, some of the book is, in fact, about that. So I'd like to see a red team scrub. I think another step we could take to uh, getting the situation back on track is for the leaders of scientific institutions. I was at MIT yesterday, and I recommended this to the MIT administration. Uh, I didn't get a great response. Uh, or the National Academies to say, there is no climate crisis. We do not need to act with the scope and pace that is being proposed. This is a serious problem. We need to think it through how we're going to attack it. And we need to put into place a many decade strategy uh, in order to deal with it. Uh, we have not had that. Uh, but I think, you know, if the leading scientists were to stand up and join me in saying, you know, there's no crisis here. Let's not get overly excited and crash other parts of society in an effort to fix this problem, which is many decades away and several gener uh, several turns around the world away. Um, that would be a good thing. But I don't think we're going to see it. On the other hand, the realities of trying to reduce emissions, whether it's the geopolitical scene or the local economic and technical scene within the U.S., I think of gradually people bringing people around to realizing uh, they've just bitten off a lot more than they could chew. Yeah, on that, um, you know, I, I, I would love your your perspective. Again, having served in Washington, served in the administration, a student participant and observer of politics and so forth, just how, how you see the trend of climate policy moving. I mean, do we seem to be emphasizing on restricting supply of fossil fuels, whether through discouraging investment in new oil and gas fields or production of cars that can run on gasoline and so forth. And, um, but are we sort of addressing maybe the supply, the demand side uh, well enough? And if we don't, do we have a mismatch there? And what could that mean for not only energy volatility, but, but political uh, support for climate policies? Are we on a good track, you think, to to uh, to improve climate policy this sort or of later this decade, I you know to do an effective policy and effective decarbonization, you have to realize first of all what's your goal, and if the goal is to zero out by twenty fit net zero by twenty fifty, which is what the administration has said, that kind of transformation in the power sector, in mobility, in uh, heating both at homes and in industry. Um, will touch every bit of society. Uh, and a serious policy would not just worry about, well, let's put a price on carbon and that's going to reduce both supply and demand, but it would worry about the pace of technological innovation. It would worry about 
the business economics, at least in the West, people have to make money by supplying energy. It will worry about how the regulations can help feed those in and would also worry about perception. Right now, if you ask the US public, they'll say, yeah, we think the climate's changing and humans are having some influence on it and something should be done about it. But if you ask them in polls, where do you rank this in priority and how much are you willing to pay? The numbers are not very encouraging for people who would like to act quickly. We have many more problems in this country that are more immediate, more certain, and more tractable than these uh, problems associated with the changing climate and reducing human influences. Right. Um, I'd like to get to uh, some of the criticisms or pushback you've gotten uh, from your book and your, 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 your comments and public speeches. A lot of it, unfortunately, but uh, probably not surprisingly, it was just ad hominem and, and, and again, uh, it's very unfortunate. But there are some substantial, uh, let's say, and reasonable even, uh, you know, criticisms. One, I think, is uh, fine. You've identified maybe some nuances and some, uh, uh, you know, differences between the uncertainties in climate science and the way they're portrayed. But this is just an excuse for doing nothing. And it's still a problem. We have to do something. And so in your book, you, you, you speak of some things to do. What, 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 what should we do, be doing? What do you think are obvious, low, no-brainers, low-hanging fruit, you know, effective things we should be doing now to address climate change? You've spoken about ways to improve the way climate science is portrayed to the public and so forth. But what other policy steps do you think we ought to be seriously considering now that are consistent with the way you view uh, the, the scope of the, of the problem? So uh, to go beyond the science and the way it's portrayed to, to get to, well, what do we do? Um, again, as I emphasize in the book, this is not a decision that scientists should be making. The scientists need to inform those decisions, but one might argue that scientists are particularly bad at trying to wrestle with those broader societal issues. So that's a political discussion. And there are some things we can do right now. Uh, certainly, RD&D, research development and demonstration of emissions light technologies. And I and many other people believe that if we're going to get to uh, a low emissions electrical system, we need a much bigger fraction of nuclear power. Um, uh, certainly, uh, the big nukes as we build them now are take a long time to build. They're expensive. When I was in the government, small modular reactors were something we stimulated. And I'm pleased to see that that program has been moving along. So we need to get those licensed and demonstrated. I would say that that's one thing. I do believe that we will see the progressive electrification of the light duty vehicle fleet. That's going to depend not only on bringing the cost of batteries down, but also putting in place the charging infrastructure and, oh, by the way, making the grid much more robust so it can support the charging of hundreds of thousands of vehicles in a city at once. Those are things that we need to do. They're going to take some time to do it. You also need to get consumer acceptance. Some people don't live in situations where an electric vehicle, a plug-in, is going to be um, convenient. Uh, and so we need to worry about that as well. Right. Uh, I think another thing that we can be doing is looking at alternative modes of dealing with the problem to the extent that it's a problem. Um, adaptation, I've written in the book, is in fact what I think society will do. I try to distinguish between what society could do, should do, and will do. I think given the difficulties in significantly reducing emissions over the next 30 or 40 years, uh, most of the world's going to adapt. And we're very good at it uh, as a species. We live in the Arctic Circle, and then we live down in the equator, and you know, societies adapt. And we've adapted to the warming of one degree already over the last century very well. So more thought into promoting adaptation where people live, for example, researching crops that are more drought resistant or water resistant, uh, things of that sort. I, I think are very important and we should be doing as well. Some people think that that distracts from reducing emissions, but it's absolutely important. 
And then, you know, as I write in the book, I think we need to understand whether geoengineering, deliberate intervention into the climate system, is an option or not. I certainly am not in favor of deploying it, but doing research as recommended by both the UK Royal Society and the National Academies of Science, uh, I think it's a very important thing we need to be doing as well. Terrific. I see some questions are starting to scroll in and I'm gonna start uh, turning to those. So let me just ask one more question with regard to the feedback and criticism you've gotten. Among your, your colleagues in the scientific community, is there anything they've thrown at you and say that you think that there's maybe a reasonable debate about some of the things we're talking about, whether it's the, uh, the line between what we, uh, human uh, influences and natural variation or uh, you know, the frequency of uh, storms and so forth. Is there anything you think that is a fair criticism? We've seen a lot of ad hominem uh, noise, but anything fair in your mind where you think there's, I, there's you know, I, on the science itself, very little. Uh, because I was very careful as I wrote the book to choose statements only from the official reports or the subsequent research literature or the official data. So it's very hard for somebody to say, you know, that's wrong. Right. Uh, I have been accused a bit of cherry picking, but I think in fact, you know, the statement that there are no long-term trends in hurricanes that have been detected so far over almost a century, that's right out of the, the uh, reports. Um, it's not highlighted in the reports, but it seems to me that that's a little bit more than a cherry. Maybe it's as big <laughs> as a watermelon or something like that. Okay. Uh, similarly, the statement that on average, the minimal, the economic impact of a warming of six degrees, which is many times more than Paris is discussing, is a few percent in the global or national economy. Now, you can believe that or not, but that's what's in the reports. And people have said, well, you didn't talk about fat tails and unlikely but high consequence events. Well, yeah, but nobody's got any real quantification on that. Or everybody says, well, it's possible that some very bad thing can happen and therefore we should reduce emissions. In the end, it's going to be a policy trade-off about just how much uh, risk one wants to take, how big those risks are, what could we do about it, and what are the other priorities in society. Right. Very good. Okay, why don't we uh, start turning to questions. The first one has a lot of numbers in it, so uh, I'll go somewhat slowly here to make sure you can uh, you get it and uh, you'll understand it, but I want to make sure we're, we're very precise. It's a, quite a detailed question. The official uh, CMIP5 climate models published before the IPCC fifth assessment report predicted 0 0.44 degrees Celsius per decade warming in the mid-troposphere for 1979 to 2019. Satellite measurements were 0 0.16 degrees Celsius per decade. For the sixth assessment report, the CMIP-6 models predicted 0 0.4 degree models Celsius per decade. Question, why after spending approximately $100 million are the models no better now than before? Well, that's a great question. Uh, I, and I have a suspicion of who asked it. Um, you, you know, the, the newest generation of models, CMIP-6, uh, which builds on CMIP-5, are in many ways worse. There is a crucial measure of the models, which is the sensitivity of the models to carbon dioxide. How much does the temperature go up uh, when you raise carbon dioxide? Obviously very important as we get to the end of the century and we'll see some increase in carbon dioxide. How much will the temperature go up on average? 40% of these new models, there are about 40 some odd of them, have a sensitivity that's so high that the IPCC had to throw them out in subsequent analysis. So that's a little bit discouraging when, in fact, you take the world's best modelers and 40% of the time they produce something that is just thrown out on general reasonableness grounds. With respect to the tropical mid tropo warming that uh, the question focuses in on, that, in fact, is covered in the report. Uh, they say, well, it's because we got the sea surface temperatures wrong. And they say if we fix the, we prescribe the sea surface temperatures 
what is actually observed, then it's better. But in fact, the sea dynamics, the ocean dynamics, are really important to climate. That's where the long-term memory is. And if the models that have both the dynamics of the ocean and the atmosphere together get it wrong, they're going to get the climate wrong. Now, the surface temperatures that the models are tuned to, they get they do a pretty good job of it. But, um, you know, this is one of the perhaps important details that the report doesn't make much of a big deal about. Right. Okay, the next two questions are similar, so I'll take them together. Uh, from my understanding of unsettled, alarmism is clearly not the appropriate response. But how do we balance concern about the very real impacts of changing environmental conditions with economic and energy stability? And the second question is similar. How much do we divest from fossil fuels and how quickly? How should we go about the energy transition? Wow. Uh, you know, I'm just a physicist. You're going to ask me these questions. <laughs> All right. I'm going to try uh, because, you know, a physicist sensibility sometimes does bring a fresh perspective to this. I, I think the first question you've got to answer is how fast do we need to do this? And the UN has said one and a half degrees, no higher than one and a half degrees. Well, they first said two degrees. and then one. You might ask, where did the two degrees come from? And about a decade ago, as I recount in the book, maybe a bit more, I asked Sharon Huber, who is the father of the two degree limit, you know, in a private conversation, I said, why did you pick two degrees and not one and a half or two and a half? And he said, well, it's about right and it's an easy number for politicians to remember. Um, so uh, it's now come down to one and a half degrees. When you look at the economic analysis that's been done, for example, by William Nordhaus, who won the Nobel Prize, for climate and environmental economics in 2018, he said the following realization. If you decarbonize too rapidly, you incur costs by too much disruption of society and deployment of immature technology. If you decarbonize too slowly, you incur greater climate risk. And therefore, there's an optimal pace at which you should decarbonize. And the estimate you can find in his 2018 Nobel lecture, and of course the papers before that, is that we could let the global temperature rise to three and a half degrees by the end of the century and still be optimal. So at least according to his analysis, and I'm sure people have done other analyses with different assumptions, the politicians have gotten way out over their skis in trying to make this transition happen. We need to change the energy system by orthodontia, slow, steady pressure, not by tooth extraction. And what's being proposed, I like to say, is a whole mouth job, all right? Uh, and we are going to damage other aspects of the national and global society if we do it too fast and in an ill-considered way. Terrific. Okay, we're going to go back to your comfort zone, and that was terrific, but comfort zone of science and so forth. The two science uh, questions, uh, modeling questions. First, uh, during the COVID-19 panic, uh, many models were created to inform policymaking. Lots of these models were very wrong, but even these have something useful to tell stakeholders. What can climate modeling learn from pandemic modeling? So that's number one. Number two, if we apply the EPA climate model under assumptions that exaggerate the future temperature climate effects of reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, the entire Biden net zero proposal, if implemented immediately, would it reduce global temperatures by 0 0.173 degrees Celsius by 2100. Paris, uh, 0 0.184 degrees Celsius, et cetera. How can these policies be justified in a benefit cost? So pandemic modeling and cost benefit of uh, you know, EPA modeling. Yeah, on, on the pandemic modeling, I'm not sure there's much to learn about the actual modeling itself, but I think what it has taught non-scientists, the decision makers, the politicians and people in the industry, is that modeling is at best an imperfect subject. And I would argue it's even more imperfect for climate than it is for epidemiology. In epidemiology, at least you have the ability to watch in almost real time what's going on. In the climate, as I said, it's a multi-decade affair. And so it's kind of hard, and we have imperfect observations going back in time. As far as 
you know, the, the efficacy of the Biden administration policy, uh, the proposed transformation of the grid, the proposed uh, banning of um, uh, sales of internal combustion engines in 15 years, the proposed curtailment of oil and gas production will be severely disruptive. And I think when they start to bite on ordinary people, which could be as soon as a couple of years, there's going to be a lot of pushback. Uh, as we've seen already in Europe uh, with the LFS, uh, uh, what's been happening in the UK with home heating mandates. Um, and we could see that have political ramifications in the next couple of elections. And more importantly, as people realize that the U.S. is only 13% of emissions globally, the rest of the world is growing, the developing world anyway, uh, people are going to ask, tell me again why we're doing this? And there isn't, I believe, a very good answer given at the moment, other than that we need to uh, avert risk or reduce risk. But if you know China and India keep forging ahead, as I would be doing if I were them, because they need the energy to develop. Um, I think it puts the U.S. effort in um, not a great light. We certainly need to develop the technologies. That's great. But let us not damage our national economy or geopolitical standing uh, by moving too rapidly. Right. And we see this play out in the pre-Glasgow discussions. You just have to read the newspapers about where India and Russia uh, and China are uh, with respect to those talks. Right. Um, question, is there any scientific merit to the argument that CO2 in the atmosphere is becoming saturated and thus incremental additions of CO2 uh, do not have much more effect on warming? Yeah. I mean, that is a well-established scientific fact. It's been known for a long time. Uh, rather than increasing linearly with carbon dioxide concentration, as um, you would expect, the human influences would increase linearly, uh, they increase logarithmically. Um, and that's because the, once the sky becomes black, it's hard to make it blacker in the wavelengths that CO2 is active. Um, I, the models, of course, take that all into account. Uh, and what really matters is not the CO2 concentration, but rather what's called the rate of forcing, the human influence on the Earth's radiation balance. And CO2 is an important part. It's perhaps the most problematic part. But there are other components that are comparable in size. One is other greenhouse gases, most importantly, methane and nitrous oxide. Uh, another is aerosols, which exert a cooling influence. And so that the warming components are about twice what carbon dioxide is currently, uh, but the cooling component is about equal to it. So the net is about what CO2 delivers. And that's been growing with time. So it's a lot more complicated than uh, just you know, you could say, well, CO2 doesn't matter because it's a slow dependence, it saturates. There are other components, and all of that is taken into account in the model projections. Right. So the good question here that comes back to this, uh, this issue of why we're not seeing more scientists speak out. Um, let's say your take on the real state of climate science is accurate. Uh, the incentives are against climate scientists speaking out in support of you. Um, just see here. Hold on a second. They, uh, there are many, uh, few, there are, few, there are few, very few high-profile scientists speaking out. Uh, they're not growing a number, and with all due respect, they, we're all getting older, uh, and they seem to be getting older. You know, can anything be done to change those incentives? And if I could just add to that, I wanted to ask earlier. I don't think we're winning the argument with the young. If you look at the young folks, uh, they are just they firmly believe uh, the imminent apocalyptic uh, crisis story. And uh, so all the more important that uh, as time remains that we we, we inform uh, them. And so what can be done, Steve, uh, to get more folks to say publicly what you say they say privately and get folks to join you in improving the quality of the debate we have? Yeah, I, I think it's not going to be something that we do deliberately that's going to um, break the logjam, if you like, or, or 
um, crash through the, the barriers. Uh, I think what's going to happen is that the steps that are being proposed will cause a deterioration in our energy system or in our geopolitical standing. We'll have to import more fuel because we're not producing it at home. Um, and that's going to cause people to re-examine the science. And I think that will open up an opportunity for those of us who are advocating for a more realistic and fact-based discussion of climate and energy uh, to step in and say, huh, we've been saying this for quite a while. In fact, you know, I wrote an op-ed on the eve of the Paris conference uh, six years ago that was published in the New York Times. I'm not sure they'd publish anything I wrote now, uh, which basically said, you know, this mitigation business is just too hard and the world is, for various reasons, and the world is just going to adapt. And I looked at that op-ed, uh, I don't know, a couple months ago, and I don't think I'd change hardly anything in what I wrote then. The basic drivers of what's going on, demographics, development, energy sources, long lifetime of CO2 in the atmosphere, haven't changed at all. And so if you push too hard on an immovable object, uh, you're going to eventually crash. And I think that crash will open up uh, an opportunity for a more realistic discussion of these matters. Yeah. And I think I want to I want to extend that with this, another question that came in and, and, and ask you to speculate a little bit, uh, put on the prognosticator hat, both as a scientist, but also as a former policy official and an astute observer. So this questioner says there's been alarmist episodes in the past that were allegedly science-based uh, and they eventually passed. I would add, I think that's absolutely right. Uh, Marxism, eugenics, uh, racism, Nazism, racial theories, racial superiority, all of these were justified at the time on, on science uh, and they passed. But uh, the political, financial, and reputational investments in, cl in the climate crisis seem to be unprecedented in their magnitude. Uh, and so taking what you said earlier about it, it's generally it's going to crash, looking forward, I mean, how do you see things working out here in terms of what will it take to uh, alter the trajectory we're on? Arguably, I think we'd all agree we, we, we seem to be on this crisis trajectory in terms of policymaking and at least among the young public opinion. What what how does it end, I guess, if you look forward to the coming years or decades with where we're headed? Yeah, I, I think, um, first of all, I, I would add Lysenkoism to your list. Uh, I think most of your list concerned um, um, human biology. Lysenkoism crashed Soviet agriculture for a couple of decades until it, uh, there was a realization they didn't have any food and that was the end of it. Um, with With respect to the energy discussion, um, I think we're going to see a continued increase in human influences on the climate. Uh, most of the projections are not a great change in weather, so I don't think we're going to see much of an impact. Uh, weather will be what it's always been with perhaps some small changes. Um, and our energy supplies in so the developing world is going to do what it's going to do i mean in its own self-interest which is right now get the energy it needs so in that way emissions are going to keep going up uh we will reduce emissions in the west if we go ahead on this trajectory the steps to do that are going to drive up the price of electricity curtail consumer choice uh make us vulnerable to uh, imports in a way that we haven't been before and there'll be some crisis some major grid failure uh we saw the texas grid failure which was not about decarbonization, but lack of capacity markets. Um, California grid is unstable. I can't believe that California has shut down one of the two nuclear plants and uh, is about to shut the second that it has, Diablo Canyon. Um, installing wind and solar uh, and uh, disfavoring gas generation. You know, if you want an all renewable grid, you need backup of some way because the wind and solar are intermittent. The most expensive part of an all-renewable grid is the reliability. 
and that multiplies the cost by factors of three or four at least. So I think when that starts to hit people and the young people as they start to become, uh, you know, uh, bill paying uh, consumers, uh, they're going to wonder, how come uh, it's so expensive? How come the grid is so unreliable? Uh, and that uh, is going to give us, again, pause to rethink this in a more rational and deliberate way. All right. We're going to hit the wall. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's unfortunate. I mean, it's yeah. a terrible thing to happen. But right. sometimes that's the only thing it, it's going to take to, to do that. Right. We had the oil shocks in the 70s, right? And uh, right. Uh, right. that changed things a lot. Right. Well, very good. Well, we're coming up on the end, uh, but I have a couple questions here. Uh, one sort of specific science-y question, and then another bigger picture, and maybe one that we can start to end, maybe even on a bit of a high note. Uh, so uh, the science question. There are uh, theories behind climate science models appear uh, do not appear to be falsifiable. How can we have science if climate uh, science of, of climate, if the theories cannot be falsified. So that's the science question. And then I asked if you could talk about technology and wealth trends in developing countries and how they're able to increasingly deal with uh, adverse climate effects as we think through the end of the century, recognizing you've said in your view, we're most likely going to end up with adaption. So those two questions. Yeah. So, you, you know, you can never disprove the climate models, at least many of them, because you can always say, well, natural variability. Oh, well, I got the sea surface temperature slightly wrong, and if I tweak that, that's good. I think the models are best for giving us a sense of what's going on and what might be going on and the mechanisms. But as I said previously, detailed predictions, forget it. They're just not, this is not what they're used for. Um, in terms of what developing countries can do, I think the most immediate things is to get reliable energy. You can see there's some film, Scott Ticker at Texas has done a wonderful film called Switch On, which is about what the impact of reliable energy is on people who don't have it. When they get it, it changes their lives. Another thing we can do about energy in developing countries is get rid of traditional biomass. 10% of the world's energy now, it comes from burning wood and dung in undeveloped societies for heating and for cooking. And when you do that inside, the particulate matter produced is a terrible health hazard. Millions of people die every year from the effects of that, uh, those particulates. And just getting them something like propane to let them cook with or heat with will have an enormous impact on their lives. Now, of course, some people who are perhaps ignorant will say, well, propane, that's a fossil fuel. We shouldn't be promoting that. But it's really a question of, uh, you know, if you want to save millions of lives right now or perhaps maybe risk some lives five decades in the future. Uh, I think I know what the answer is and what it needs to be. So I would say for the developing countries, full speed ahead on getting that energy by whatever means you can, balancing the local effects. Um, worry about CO2 later. And that's exactly what you see the Chinese and the Indians uh, and other folks uh, trying to move up the economic ladder do. Great. I'm going to take the, pro the prerogative and, and ask the last question in our remaining three minutes. And this has just been fantastic. Thank you. Um, I'm sure you and your colleagues at AEI, I know I and my friends uh, in Washington who are thinking about energy and climate policy um, are uh, and anticipating that we're probably going to hit the wall and there's gonna be a moment to reflect and reconsider. Uh, you know, you get two different uh, sort of strains of advice on, um, on how to deal with the science. And I would love your thought about it as sort of more of a political and a policy matter. One is to say, look, don't reopen the science. It, it's too late. It's whether it's settled or not, the public thinks it's settled. And reopening these, asking the questions that you 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 pose, raising those issues, you know, it's that's just uh, the companies have moved on. Everyone signed up to uh, net, you know Paris and net zero. The discussion has moved on to what do we do about it, and we're going to net zero. So really, we encounter uh, you know among well-meaning folks, smart folks, even who harbor 
sort of the, the concerns about the misrepresentation of the science that you've laid out. Some people say, look, it's too late. Uh, the, that horse has left the barn. What would your advice be, Steve, to your colleagues, those younger folks who are coming up in policy, thinking about ways to improve? Should we leave it um, uh, leave it alone and move on to just uh, geoengineering adaption and, and mitigation and, and perhaps better and slower ways? Or ought to we to we reopen the debates on, on science? Well, you know, I don't think one needs to have a debate about the science. Uh, again, the most recent UN report says, you know, low emission scenario, high emission scenarios are unlikely. Low emission scenarios will lead to one and a half, 1.7 degrees of warming further in this century. The globe has already warmed one degree. The greatest improvement in human condition has happened while that happened. Uh, we're not going to see a great economic impact from 1.5 degrees more, 1.6 degrees more. And in fact, the reports say that. You just have to try to educate people about what the reports actually say. And again, I think if our institutions, uh, if there's any integrity in the science advising apparatus in the White House, in the national academies, they would issue a statement saying, hey, there's no crisis. Here's what the reports have said. Um, and let us back off a bit and not over egg the custard. Uh, that's, I think, would be a very graceful and, in fact, uh, patriotic way, if you like, of getting out of the situation that we've gotten in where it looks like there's an impending crash. Terrific. Steve, thank you very much for spending this hour with us. Thank you to Randy and your colleagues at AEI for hosting this event. Thank all of you for, for joining in your superb questions. And Steve, keep it up. We need your voice in this debate. Everyone Th have thanks, a great day. Thanks for talking, Bob. This is great. Everybody for listening.